want to welcome you all here this morning. Um, do, we have, do we have any visitors this morning? Well, I know Pastor Al, he's not a visitor now. He's, he's kind of like a regular. Uh, see, uh, I mean, Marcella, you have a family here? Would you like to introduce them to us? Well, welcome. Make sure you greet them before they leave this today. A um, couple, couple of updates. Um, James Slater, a little chap there with a cast on his leg. I guess they're going into Phoenix Children's Hospital on uh, Wednesday for evaluation uh, to help treat that leg to heal a little bit better a little faster. Um, the other medical update that we have, would I don't know if you all know him, John Holman. If you, if you haven't paid a whole lot of attention, he usually sits back in the booth and sound booth and runs the slides and such. Well, he was in a terrible motorcycle accident this last week. Um, severe injuries, although Quite a blessing that they are not life-threatening and that he will heal from them. But in the meantime, he's, there, he's being, they're dealing with some fractured vertebrae sign, uh, in his spine. He's got uh, some broken vertebrae in his neck, and they've had to put a, put a halo on him to prevent his head from moving. So he's going to be dealing with that for some time. So it's going to be a long recovery for him. So continue to keep him in his prayers. I don't know if there was a card going around, too. I don't know if that's still going around for, for just, yeah, get well card, an encouragement card. If it gets around, please sign that, and, and uh, we'll get that to him. I'm sure that will be quite a blessing. Um, tonight's evening service at 6 o'clock here, we're going to be continuing the video series on the book of Ruth, uh, titled Redeemed. We're in the fifth section so I encourage you to be here at 6 o'clock. Um, next, next Thursday, there's a ladies' lunch brunch. Lunch, lunch bunch? Yeah. A bunch of lunch? Yeah. Or, or something. I believe there's a sign-up sheet in the foyer for that, at right? Casa Serrano. And it's going to be at Casa Serrano. I should have asked her first. Okay, in any case... Um, you fill that out. And then, um, let's see, next Sunday. Next Sunday, we got a shared meal, I believe. Yep, look, it's right there. Must have one. So there's another sign-up sheet in the foyer for that, for those that would like to bring something. Um, next Sunday, also, Tim Charlie will be here. So he'll be, he'll be speaking in the morning service, also in the evening service. But... Uh, Next Sunday evening, that's the fifth Sunday. And I like to uh, bring in a little additional music. We've, had, we've got some special music from some volunteers as well. Tim will be uh, sharing his music as well. And if there's anything you want to uh, join in with, again, let me know. But that'll be at 6 o'clock next Sunday evening. I think that's all the announcements I have. I don't believe I've forgotten any. Um, let's, let's stand with hymn number 53. We'll be singing the first, second, and fourth verse of Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. Joyful, joyful, we adore Thee. Thy works 
remain standing, I will be sharing <coughs> scripture from Romans chapter 15, beginning in verse 8. For I tell you that Christ became a servant to the circumcised to show God's truthfulness in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs and in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy, as it is written. Therefore, I will praise you among the Gentiles and sing your name. And again it is said, Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let the peoples extol him. And again Isaiah says, The root of Jesse will come, even he who arises to rule the Gentiles. In him will the Gentiles hope. May the God of hope fill you with joy and peace and believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. We thank you, Lord, for your goodness, for your grace, for your mercy, that we can just adore you in, in thought, word, and deed. We do that with gladful hearts, Lord, knowing what you have done, rejoicing in who you are, proclaiming your, your sovereignty over all things, Lord. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity. What a blessing it is to be able to come together, lifting up our voices in praise and song, and in, open up your word in worship. Again, we thank you, Lord, for who you are, and we proclaim, proclaim your righteousness. Thank you. Just pray that you use this time for your purpose. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Rejoice, the Lord is King. It's in number 245 if you're following along. Rejoice, the Lord is King. to do so all and the song is titled all heaven declares the glory of the risen lord i'll play in the same key okay. <laughs> Bow the knee and worship. 
worship him alone. I will proclaim the glory of the risen Lord, who once was slain to reconcile Before the throne of God above. We have a strong and perfect plea. Speaking of our great high priest, Jesus Christ our Lord. will be preaching again from the pulpit this morning. Welcome. Thank you, Rick. What he meant to say is I'll be preaching my heart out. The privilege of proclaiming God's word. Tell you a couple more things about John. We almost lost him. John Holman. Um, 
However, the Lord was very gracious to him and to Eva and to us. Eva sent, I was tempted to show them on the overhead, but I thought I'd better not. Um, she sent two pictures, actually three pictures. One was of his motorcycle, which is a mess. Um, the other was of John and his new halo. And I told John when we were there, I said, you finally earned your halo. <laughs> and, he, and I'm his pastor, and he stuck his tongue out at me. <laughs> and then he chuckled, and it hurt, so he stopped <laughs> chuckling. But, um, and then she sent another picture just yesterday of him in his halo. And, and all she said was, shave and haircut two bits. No beard, very little hair on top. You wouldn't even recognize him. And he has this cheesy grin on his face. But uh, the, the really, really good thing is one of his nurses said, when we get motorcycle accident victims here, typically they're in two categories. One is they don't survive. And the other is they survive with major brain injuries. John has a laceration from his forehead all the way back, almost to his neck. Um, but he has no brain bleeds at all. Uh, virtually, if not literally, miraculous. The Lord spared him, and he, <coughs> excuse me, the nurse said, all of his ailments, all of his injuries are going to heal. It's going to be a long haul, but he's going to recover, and he's going to heal. And that is God's special gift to him, and of course to us as well. And James Slater I understand he had a second birthday yesterday. Happy birthday, James. And we're so, happy birthday, buddy. Um, we're so thankful that he's gonna get some really good consultation and some care in, in Phoenix for that leg that he broke. Any other birthdays? I don't wanna miss anybody. Birthdays, anniversaries last week? Pardon? Fran. I'm looking for Fran. Oh, there you are, Fran. Of course, Fran's not going to say anything. She's really quiet. Happy birthday, Fran. Anybody else? I just didn't want that to pass by without acknowledging you. Oh, if you have your pen and pencil, I have a birthday coming up on August 20th. I just, <laughs> just and now it's on video, so there's no excuse. Oh, you know, I'm going to do that, and then you're going to do something special. I'm going to be very, very embarrassed. But anyway, happy, happy to be alive. Um, to celebrate number 79, Lord willing. All right, now, enough of that. Um, I invite you to bow with me, please. And then we're going to go to our passage for this morning, which is in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. But let's pray first. Father, we are so thankful for you, for your grace, for your love, for your mercy shown to us in so many ways, in our personal lives, in the life of John and Eva. Thank you for sparing John. Um, we pray that he'll continue to heal well and heal at whatever pace you appoint for him. Teach him the lessons that he needs to learn uh, from your grace and the depth and breadth of your love, the lessons that we can only learn at times like this. I also pray for John Morris, who is grieving the loss of his son, Pray that you will continue to encourage him, sustain him, undergird him. But Father, now as we come to your word, we are deeply grateful that you have entrusted it to us as a church family and as individual believers. And my prayer is that what I share this morning would be accurate, would be impactful by your spirit's work in us, and that we would be different, that we would be more like Christ for having been together in this passage this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 35 through 49. We're continuing in our study of this wonderful chapter. And Paul is talking about resurrection in general. But this morning, he talks about our resurrection bodies. And if you're like me, you've given it a lot of thought and, and a lot of questions. What, what is it going to be like to leave this world enter into the presence of the Lord, absent from the body, present with the Lord, and then someday in God's timing to be reconnected with a new glorified body. Um, I wish Scripture said more about it, but what Scripture says about it 
primarily is in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So we're going to begin to look at what Paul does say about it this morning. Again, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 35 through 49. So far, we have seen that everyone, whether believers or unbelievers, will be resurrected. In fact, Jesus said, and I'm reading here from John chapter 5. You needn't turn there. We'll be back to 1 Corinthians in just a moment. John chapter 5, verses 25 through 29. Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For just as the Father has life in himself, even so he gave to the Son also to have life in himself. And he gave him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this. For an hour is coming in which all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and will come forth. Those who did the good deeds to a resurrection of life, those who committed the evil deeds to a resurrection of judgment. So there you have it. And we're not going to go into that passage at all, but just a statement that everybody will be resurrected, some to a resurrection of life in the presence of the Lord, and some to a resurrection of judgment. Now, in this morning's passage, Paul's going to begin to describe what our resurrected bodies will be like. And this is part one of, I'm not sure how many parts it'll be, depends on how deeply I go into the passage, but this is part one of a series. Um, And Paul begins now to describe our resurrection body. And in doing so, he will ask two questions. And then by way of four categories of illustration, he will answer them. And these illustrations would have all been very familiar to his initial readers and, of course, will be pretty familiar to us as well. So this should give us some insight into our own resurrected bodies. The passage, again, is 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 35 through 49. Please follow along. As I read, I'm reading from the New American Standard Version. You follow along in your translation. But someone will say, how are the dead raised? And with what kind of body do they come? You fool. That which you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And that which you sow, you do not sow the body which is to be, but a bare grain, perhaps of wheat or of something else. But God gives it a body just as he wished and to each of the seeds a body of its own. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is the flesh of men, and there is another flesh of beasts, and another flesh of birds, and another of fish. There are also heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly is one, and the glory of the earthly is another. There is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars, for stars differ from star to star. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown a perishable body. It is raised an imperishable body. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. So also it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living soul. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, then the spiritual. The first man is from the earth, earthy. The second man is from heaven. As is the earthy, so also are those who are earthy. And as is the heavenly, so also are those who are heavenly. Just as we have been born I'm sorry, just as we have borne the image of the earthly, earthy, we also will bear the image of the heavenly. Now, there's a lot there, but it, it is sequential. It is fairly obvious in its interpretation, so it will go fairly quickly. Paul begins with what are really two mocking questions. Verse 35, but someone will say, how are the dead raised? And with what kind of body do they come? Now, actually, in the context, what Paul is addressing, it probably sounds more like, how are the dead raised? And with what kind of body do they come? Come on, Paul, give us a break, that kind of thing. 
Because Paul is, even though those are legitimate questions under a different set of circumstances, Paul is continuing his rebuke of those who either didn't believe in resurrection or those who didn't even believe in God but who were part of the church fringe or those who were believers and listening to those who didn't believe in resurrection. And so in, in, in the latter part of this chapter, the earlier verses, Paul addresses those entities. And I'm not going to go back and review all of that. But he's continuing his rebuke of those unbelievers, unbelieving, not believing in resurrection, even though those are legitimate questions. So he's continuing his rebuke. Uh, you may remember verses 33 and 34, where Paul says, Do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. Become sober-minded as you ought and stop sinning, for some have no knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. And then in a very real sense, he addresses those who have no knowledge of God and who deny the resurrection. So Paul is very pointed here, and, and he's very direct toward them. But he gives some important answers. Now, the ones who deny the resurrection wouldn't really care about his answers to those questions. But he answers them nonetheless. And we are thankful he did because it gives us some insight into our resurrection bodies. And of course, it instructs those genuine believers who are his initial readers about their own resurrected bodies. Now, Paul gives to those two mocking questions two answers, really. One is what I call the short answer, and the other is the long answer. The short answer is verse 36a, you fool. You fool. Now, come on, Paul. Just say what you mean. Don't beat around the bush, you know. You fool. Now, I read that, and, and what struck me first is what might strike you. Didn't Jesus say that if you call somebody a fool, you're in danger of hellfire? That's exactly what Jesus said. I'm thinking of Matthew 5.22. Whoever says, you fool, shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. Now, that's, that's serious stuff. So the question that came to my mind is Paul sinning here. Is he going to have to repent for being overly exuberant or overly negative? Well, the answer to that is no. In fact, you fool is not the best translation of what Paul said, but it's the translation that most translators use because it fits the context, but it doesn't really explain the context. Um, Paul used the word Aphron, A-P-H-R-O-N, the Greek word aphron, which means unreasonable or unwise. You unreasonable, unwise person is what he's saying in the Greek text. Jesus used the Greek word M-O-R-E, more or more. Different word, stronger, stronger word, stronger context. That's what he forbade. In fact, Jesus himself, and I'm thinking here of Matthew 23, verse 17, and elsewhere, Jesus said, you fools and blind men, which are more important, the gold in the temple or that which sanctifies the gold? Um, some people were swearing by the temple and some people swearing by the gold. And Jesus said, you fools, but he uses the word aphron. So, just, so there's no contradiction here. Paul was not sinning. He was being strong, he was being deliberate, he was being direct, but he wasn't sinning. He wasn't violating what the Lord said he should not do. Well, that brings us to the long answer. The short answer is you unreasonable, unthinking people. The long answer. Paul answers both of those questions with a series of illustrations. And the illustrations, again, are straightforward. They're fairly clear. So let's go through them. The first illustration is from agriculture. Now, he, what he's illustrating, and there's a, there's a latent question here that I haven't mentioned. Excuse me. Some of those mockers were saying, in effect, how can there be a resurrection when you're saying whatever goes into the ground comes out very different? So it isn't a resurrection of that body. It's a resurrection of... It's not even a resurrection, it's just something else coming out of the grave. And so Paul is using a series of illustrations to show that the principle, the need for something to die in one form 
and then be resurrected to newness of life in another form is absolutely consistent. And he uses first a, a, a seed. And you understand, you put a seed in the ground, and it has to die before it will produce a plant. The plant it produces is the product of the seed, but it isn't the seed. It's something different. It's something better. It has life. So that's what he's illustrating here in verse 36. That which you sow, which you put in the ground, does not come to life unless it dies. That's the principle. We all understand that principle. The key idea is a seed must die before it produces life. In other words, death is necessary for resurrection, obviously. In John chapter 12, verse 24, Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth it, and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. And that fruit doesn't look like the seed, but it is born of the seed. It is a natural product of the seed. We could say it this way. What you sow is different from what will grow. I just made that up. I think I'll say it again. What you sow is different from what will grow. Yes, you may quote me on that. Anyway, verse 37. And that which you sow, you do not sow the body which is to be, that is the plant, but a bare grain, perhaps of wheat or of something else. So obviously here, God designed each seed with a distinctive body. Verse 38, but God gives it a body just as he wished, and to which of the seeds, and to each of the seeds, a body of its own. In other words, and I thought about this and I worshiped because of this, every seed is a testimony to God's creative genius. Every seed has a design, and it will produce what it was intended and what was, it was designed to produce. That's a fixed design, and it's the fixed design by God. Wheat will always produce wheat, barley will always produce barley, corn will always produce corn, and so on. And someone might say, well, that's just natural. There's nothing supernatural about that. No, no, it's divine design. Every farmer should be a solid, dyed-in-the-wool Christian because they deal with this every day. They see it. They see it blooming. They see it growing. They water it. They nurture it. They, they, they live off the produce of it. It's, it's a wonderful thing. I wasn't raised on a farm, but I understand the principles, and it's to the glory of God. Every seed has been, by God, designed with a particular body, and it just keeps going on and on and on, and will continue to do so until he says enough. Well, that's an illustration from agriculture. The second illustration Paul gives is an illustration from flesh. Verse 39, all flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one flesh of men and another flesh of beasts and another flesh of birds and another of fish. Again, Paul states the obvious. However, and this is kind of a footnote, having said that, evolutionists would have us believe that the flesh of fish became the flesh of man and so on. Scripture soundly rejects and refutes that error. Each kind, Genesis tells us, reproduces according to its own kind. One kind doesn't produce another kind. Fish don't produce the flesh of men and women, of humans. But that's the illustration he gives. There's a lot of flesh, but they're not all the same. They're different. Then he gives the illustration from the heavens. Verse 40, there are also heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly is one and the glory of the earthly is another. Heavenly bodies here, the celestial bodies. Uh, he specifically mentions the sun, the moon, and the stars. Earthly bodies, the terrestrial bodies, bodies, animals, humans, and so on. And he mentions the glory, that is, the, the luster, the beauty of form, of color, that which makes something what it is in, visually, the glory of it. And he said that the stars differ in magnitude and in brilliancy from one another. Verse 41, there is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars, 
for stars differ from star in glory. Now, he doesn't mention planets. This isn't a scientific treatise. It is an observation. And so he mentions stars and the moon and the sun. Now, I have a slide I want to show you. Some of you may have seen this already. Could you uh, turn these lights off for just a moment? Thank you, Joe. Have you seen this or, or something similar? I'm going to read, and it's short, but I'm going to read the caption that came with this. Um, this is from the James Webb Space Telescope, which is the newest arsenal. Incredible pictures it's sending back, and this is one of them. It's one of the first. And I'm quoting here. This landscape of mountains and valleys speckled with glittering stars is actually the edge of a nearby young star-forming region called NGC 3324 in the Carina Nebula. Captured in infrared light by NASA's new James Webb Space Telescope, this image reveals for the first time previously invisible areas of star birth. Called the Cosmic Cliffs, Webb's seemingly three-dimensional picture looks like craggy mountains on a moonlit evening. This is incredible. In reality, it is the edge of the giant gaseous cavity within NGC 3324, and the tallest peaks in this image are about seven light years high. The cavernous area has been carved from the nebula by the intense ultraviolet radiation and stellar winds from extremely massive, hot, young stars located in the center of the bubble above the area shown in the image, close quote. I just wanted you to see that so you can praise the Lord and marvel at, at what he has created. And this is just one look at it. Never seen before. And if you want to go online and, and look up the James Webb Telescope, you'll see dozens and dozens of pictures that it has sent back of areas of space that have never been seen. Paul mentions the stars and the sun and the moon and because that's what was obvious, and that was enough to make his point. They're not all the same. They have their own glory, but God created them all. God knows how to do that. Then he brings it all together in verse 42. How do, how do all of those illustrations relate to resurrection? Because this is the main point. Paul is getting to. Resurrection, he says, is similar. This is verse 42, or a portion of 42. So also, the resurrection of the dead. It is similar in a number of ways. First of all, verse 42, it is sown a perishable body. It is raised an imperishable body. You see, the seed goes in the ground, the plant grows. It's different, but it's from the same. The body is perishable. Obviously, it died, goes into the ground. At the, at the right time, it is raised in newness of life. So also is resurrection of the dead. Verse 43, it is sown in dishonor, that is, in sin, corruption, death, decay. It's sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. Verse 43, it is shown in, sown in weakness. It is raised in power. Verse 44, it is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. The if there is what's called a first class conditional clause in the Greek. You've heard me say that often if you've been here quite a while. What, what it means is since there is. Since there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. The natural body here is referring to um, the, organi the organism, the human animated organism that is animated by a soul. And that phase of the immaterial, that phase of the immaterial principle in man is that which uh, is more nearly allied with the flesh itself and which characterizes man as a mortal creature. The spiritual body is the body fitted for eternity, which is characterized as it relates to God and is energized and um, animated by a redeemed spirit and the spirit of God indwelling believers, but a redeemed spirit. 
So we have a natural body with the soul, a spiritual body that is energized by the Holy Spirit and a redeemed spirit. Additionally, then, Paul expands his, his, his illustration by referring to Adam as contrasted to Christ. Verse 45, so also it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living soul. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Adam was the physical head of the human race, the natural body. Christ is the spiritual head of the redeemed race, the spiritual body. Then Paul mentioned the order of transformation, verse 46. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural. Then the spiritual. And the parallel here is, is the plant isn't first. The seed is first. It goes into the ground, it dies, and it produces the plant. The natural man dies, and God raises it as a spiritual body. And in verses 47 and 48, he mentions the earthly versus heavenly. The first man, Adam, is from the earth, earthy. The second man, Christ, is from heaven. As is the earthy, so also are those who are earthy. In other words, all human beings are earthy. And as is the heavenly, so also are those who are heavenly, those who are redeemed, those who have resurrected spiritual bodies. Now let me remind you that scripture teaches that when you die as a Christian, your spirit goes immediately to be with the Lord. And then in due time, and we don't know when that is, well, we know sequentially when it is, but we don't know actually when it is, the Lord will resurrect your body, a new body. Take heart, okay? A new body, it'll be perfect. And scripture calls it a spiritual body. And we'll, we'll reunite that spiritual body with your soul, your spirit. Now, the, the best look we have at that is the resurrected body of Christ. It was still flesh and bone because his disciples were fearful of him. And Jesus said, don't be afraid. A spirit does not have flesh and bone as you see that I have. And that was after the resurrection. So he had flesh, he had bone, and yet he could move from one dimension to another. Went right through walls, just appeared one dimension to another. That's gonna be fun. I'm kind of, look, kind of looking forward to that, but there's so much more to it than that, of course. But that's really the only look that I'm aware of in scripture that we get of a resurrected body. A human being, obviously God-man, dying physically, but of course not spiritually, and then being resurrected and having a resurrected body. So we're gonna be similar to that. The old body, the old flesh going into the grave, then being resurrected at some point in the future. Verse 49, just as we have borne the image of the earthly, we will also bear the image of the heavenly. I want to close with 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 9. This is Paul's summary description. I love it. We're going to see more about the resurrected body as we unfold the rest of this chapter. But this is 2 Corinthians, written to the same group of people. Chapter 5, verses 1 through 9. We know that if the earthly tent, our body, which is our house, is torn down, we have a building from God a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For indeed, in this house we groan, longing to be clothed with our dwelling from heaven, inasmuch as we, having put it on, will not be found naked. For indeed, while we are in this tent, we groan, um, being burdened, because we do not want to be unclothed, but to be clothed. So that, so that, I'm sorry, so that what is mortal will be swallowed up by life. Now he who prepared us for this very purpose is God and gave, uh, and gave to us the spirit as a pledge. Therefore, being always of good courage, 
And knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight, we are of good courage. I say and prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord. Therefore, we also have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to him. So looking forward to what will be after we are absent from this body and present from the Lord, Paul says, be of good courage. Be of good courage. And I say that to you as well. Whatever, whatever the trials are, whatever the, the difficulties are in this fleshly body, it will end. It will be behind us. But in the meantime, we are seeking to be pleasing to God, and we are seeking to be more consistent with the life and the character of his son, Jesus Christ. Please bow with me. Father, thank you for this text. Thank you for the promises that you have given of a resurrected body. But beyond that, the promise that we will be in your presence without sin, without the ability to sin, without the hindrance of sin or a hindrance of the flesh. Father, thank you for these promises that do give us great courage, especially at times of difficulties. We thank you for the times ahead of us this week, the things that you have planned for us that we aren't even aware of. Help us to be faithful. Help us to look to you to be faithful in our thinking, in our choices, in the way we conduct our lives. We want to glorify you in all things. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I do invite you to stand. We're going to sing one more song, and then Jaime is going to come and close our service in prayer. That song is not in the songbook, but it's a wonderful little song called He is Able, and this is such a, a great promise and reality. He is able. Pastor, church, are you grateful this morning? Amen. Are you thankful? I mean, it's good to tell the Lord, Lord, I love you. Thank you for all that you have done. So I'm going to pray now. Father, we thank you, Lord God, for what you have bestowed upon our hearts this morning. We thank you for your grace and your mercy, your goodness and your kindness, Father. We thank you for all that you continue to do and how you continue to share and shower us with your presence and your love. We ask thee, Father God, as 
our brothers and sisters depart this morning to whatever it is that they're going, whether they're going home for lunch or out to lunch with somebody, we pray, Father God, your hand be upon them, that you continue to keep us strong, and that we continue to look to you, for you are our hope, and you are our God, you are our Savior, and we thank you, we praise you, and the people of God said, Amen. Amen. Have a good day, church. You're dismissed.